What if you could control things around you just by thinking it? Well, this is the potential of human-computer interface. It's Saturday night, it's Saturday morning, and you're deep in sleep, sweet sleep, and guess who decides to pounce on your bed? It's your dog. And he's been holding it all night, and he needs to go really bad. So he keeps on licking and pestering you until you're finally forced to get out of bed. And with your eyes half closed, you grab onto that robe and you put it on and then you go downstairs, right? You know what I'm talking about if you have a dog. And you open up that front door and you're hit immediately with an arctic wind. But you manage, you push yourself forward, you go outside and the dog's doing his business. And then guess what you see? You see your favorite neighbor driving by. He yells out his, his window. Hey, I love that pink robe that you're wearing. Apparently, I grabbed the wrong robe. Imagine if you didn't have to deal with the hassle of taking that dog out. What if you could just simply think it and it actually worked? Well, that is what we're talking about in terms of the opportunity for a brain-machine interface. What if all you had to do was just think and then magically, your robot, Luna, takes your dog out for a walk, which then frees you up to go back to sweet sleep again. Sounds exciting? Wonderful, right? Now, there is a problem, actually. The problem is, what happens if your dog gets a hold of this technology? Seriously. Oh, ho, ho, ho. who's the master now? And the dog says, you know, I don't get humans. Why do they always shake hands to greet each other? That's so rude. I'm going to show them the proper etiquette of sniffing. <laughs> and moreover, it's perfectly OK to gnaw if you have an itch or lick yourself, and then proceed to lick someone right in the face. It's perfectly sanitary. It really is. Now here's another example, a problem actually. What happens if your wife gets a hold of this brain technology? Right? She says, honey, how do I look at my dress? You know what that means, right guys? She telepathically tells you that if you tell her that she looks fat, you're so dead. And if you tell her that she looks great, she's gonna kill you for lying. So what's a guy to do, right? Raise your hand if you have a typewriter at home. Great. Well, one of the key innovations was a white, white ribbon that if you remember, could actually remove your mistakes, right? By putting white ink over it. Well, we gone from the days of typewriters to computers and now mobile devices. And what's really interesting is if you actually know your history, that's a span of a century and a half of human history from typewriters to now. And in that time period, do you know what our primary interface was? Touch. It's been touch. But the future the future is that of new human interfaces. Raise your hand if you have an Amazon Echo at home or a Dot. Great. I do too. I use it to reorder my supplies, tell Alexa to turn on the music, and tell it to spank my kids. Well, the future is about the ability to be able to mind and combine the best. We are actually very much moving from this era of sentiment to sentience, where AI is going to start to understand your context and to anticipate your needs. Moreover, we're also going from the era of 
robotics to bionics, where our senses to human capabilities are going to be augmented. And in these situations, one of the key things that's going to emerge is a new set of HCI, human computer interfaces, and particularly speech, natural language processing, and mind control. In 1924, Hans Berger was the first person to be able to actually measure the brain activity by means of EEG. And this became the start of what we call brain-computer interface, or BCIs. Now, BCIs are different from neuroprosthetics. Neuroprosthetics is really when you're able to connect the nervous system to a device, such as a retinal implant. Whereas a BCI, brain-computer interface, is when you're connecting the brain to a machine a computer machine. As early as 1960s, researchers have been trying to interpret brain signals to be able to actually convert that to a BCI to then produce movements. One of the early successes of this was a monkey that could actually control a robotic arm with his brain. And in the 1960s, researchers started to push further ahead and they started to implement, implant, implant neural tropical cone um, electrodes into the brain. And UC Berkeley, for example, what they did was they actually implemented these things into cats and they were able to decode the neuronal firings to be able to actually reproduce what the cat saw. So in effect, what they did was the researchers can actually see what the cats actually saw. Pretty incredible. Now when it comes to human BCI, brain-computer interface falls under three categories. One is that of invasive, and that is actually an open skull such as neuroplastic. The second category is partially invasive, such as electrocorticography, or ECOG. And the last category is non-invasive, such as EEG headsets. By the way, raise your hand if you're okay with having electrodes implanted in your brain. Anybody? Anybody? I think I see somebody there. No, you cannot implant it in your husband's brain, no. Well, the exciting thing about this is we, we've known that invasive approach usually yields better results. That's pretty obvious. But the pioneering work of the future is being able to take the non-invasive and to get it to a point where it's actually able to provide same or better fidelity in terms of signal processing. And that's the exciting field that we're talking about. Now, most of you are familiar with EEG. Right? There was a study in, in 2014 where researchers were able to take severely motor impaired patients and to compare the signals coming from a non-invasive EEG device with a muscle connected communication channel. And they were able to show that the non-invasive EEG technology that they use was in fact actually superior. That's very exciting, really exciting. Now there's one question though. Who is ready to wear EEG headsets every day? Anybody? I don't know about you, but when I look at this photo, that's not really a tremendous marketing piece. It's not really doing much for me. And by the way, uh, that's how I look when I told them that I would not turn in my tax returns. So this brings us to our partner, Free Logic, where their pioneering work is in non-invasive human computer interface. And it's exciting 
And what's exciting is that you don't actually have to put anything on the head. Now, in order for us to understand this technology, let me just give you a little bit of a primer. This area is called electrodermal potential and conductance, or EDP for short. And the larger area is called electrodermal activity, or EDA. Now, what EDA does is it actually takes the active and passive electrical properties from your skin. And historically, EDA has been associated with galvanic skin response, which is a measurement of sweat, which gives you an indication in terms of your physiological or psychological arousal, such as in the case of anxiety. So yeah, you can say that EDA is a sweaty mess. Well, free logic, in conjunction with independent researchers, have actually applied the science of EDP, electrodermal potential, to understand the human cognition, not just sweat. And what they were able to do was they were able to empirically investigate and correlate the difference between a scalp capture EEG versus EDP, electrodermal potential, capture from the body below the head. To be able to identify between relaxation versus attention. And here's what they found out. Comparing EDP, electrodermal potential, to EEG, EDP had an 84% classification accuracy. That's incredible to be able to determine if, it's, if you're in the tension or relaxation states. Now compare that to EEG, that was able to produce 84 to, I believe, 89% accuracy using a single channel EEG signal. That is astounding. I mean, that's a big deal. Because again, you're not wearing anything on your head. This is all being captured through the body. Now, I can tell you about this technology, or I can show you. So what we're gonna do is now we're gonna actually transition into the demo portion. So this is my beautiful assistant, Oleg. <laughs> Are you ready? Uh... It, you're gonna be in a lot of pain now. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just uh, joking here. Thank you. Um, All right. So this takes this takes a tremendous concentration, and uh, it's important to note that there are no hand remotes or controls. This is not a trick. It is actually taking the signal from my body and signal processing it and converting it into ability to actually control things. In this first demo, I'm gonna actually show you that I can actually control that light that you see over there. Now, in order for me to get into this position, I have to focus, so please, everyone, please, silence. Actually, that's optional. So here we go. And that was all, again, my attention, my focus. By the way, it's kind of hard when your adrenaline's going. My second demo is going to be using the same electrodermal potential to be able to actually move our little friend here, BB-8, here. And again, please, silence, because I need concentration. All right, BB-8's coming apart. Let's try it again. Okay, great. Try, try it again? Try it again? No. Too, too, too active. 
Thank, thank you. All right. So for a third demo, I'm going to actually invite the CEO of Freer Logic, Peter Freer, to come up. And he's going to actually demonstrate something that's quite incredible, which is he can actually show that EDP can be used for driver cognition. So what we have here, and I'm going to move this table in just a bit, is a simulated driver. So that same technology has been embedded into this headset to be able to, without actually touching the brain with a distance about, about so, can actually read the electrical brain signal and will actually know if you're focused or if you're distracted. So please. This is a headrest that has the technology in it. We're working with three major OEMs and two tier one suppliers. This will be in your car, hopefully within the next two years. So sensors are inside here. And if you think of this like um, a radio telescope pointed out to space, we can pick up a quasar, pulsar that is um, several million light years away. So the idea, nothing is injected into the user. We're just simply listening to the brain. So my head's not actually gonna touch this. I'll sit here. First thing I'll do is bring up a plotter so you can actually see my brain activity through the headrest here. A lot of Bluetooth in the room. And I'm gonna scale this up so you can actually get a little bit better view. All right, these are actual brain data from me through the headrest in real time. I'm gonna to try to create an interference pattern so you can see that uh, that interference pattern happens from my motion. So you can see this is, these are real data coming from my head without contact. Now this is the interesting part. I'll give you a driving simulator that we use with uh, the major uh, tier ones and uh, OEMs right now. So I will use my attention to actually start the simulator, then I'll answer my cell phone and uh, show you what happens. So that you'll also notice, by the way, there's no calibration to this. It's instantly calibrating to me as we uh, talk. Can you at least hold that for me? Right here. Again, there we go. All right. So we just have to connect. There we go. Okay. Now you can see this, the green bar on the side is my attention. I'm gonna to try to focus on it to start moving. I'm gonna answer my cell phone and start to try to dial the number. Now it stops because it notices a change in the signal. So we'll do it again. I'll run it up to where I'm driving really well. And I'm gonna yell at the kids in the back seat. If you don't stop fighting, I'm gonna turn the car around right now. You can see it detects again. If you could hear the software, it's saying driver distraction detected and it's detecting that I'm a little distracted during my talk. So again, I'll run it. Just as if I'm driving. Now I'm gonna to try to text on my cell phone. And you can see it stops. Now I try to focus back in. Okay, so you get an idea in real time, we can now detect uh, cognitive load driver distraction. So to tie all this together, you know, it used to be that thermostat was a thermostat and homes and cars didn't communicate with one another. Well, that was a pass. Today, we're looking at this. There's a major change happening now, and this is the premise of this conference, which is the Internet of Things. And this will bring about significant change. Magnitude, we've heard the 50 billion connected devices by 2020. Well, imagine if these things start to connect everything from your steering wheel that tells me that I'm a bad driver to the toilet that keeps on texting me that, hey, you left the toilet seat up. 
again. Well, the future of the Internet of Things, when you have potentially thousands of connected things in your work, your home, public spaces, and your car, you cannot afford to have separate apps for all of these connected devices. So the future is really a new form of human-computer interface that's going to be focused on voice and brain-enabled technologies, like the ones we're talking about. Moreover, to help orchestrate all of these things that's potentially in the billions, all of us will eventually have a personal ambient AI assistant that will then help coordinate with the devices, apps, as well as other AI agents. And the way you're going to communicate with your AI assistant is through voice, is through brain computer interface. The future of humanity is that of superhuman capabilities. From our intellect, our senses, to our physical capabilities, we are in the process of being enhanced and amplified. And we will soon be able to actually control everything around us just by thinking it. So remember this, the next time you want to do something big or small, just think it. Believe it, believe that you can do it, you have the power to do it, and just think it. Thank you.